Yes, this is something that should have been done a long time ago, but I didn't do it because I figured more people than I thought would know would already know a lot of the chronology that I was dealing with. And, and that's obviously not the case. Not everybody has gone full schizo yet like I have. All right, but that's okay. Let's get you guys on the journey to losing your mind, but also discovering the truth about our history. And when I say our history, I mean the entire planet's history. It does not matter where you reside on Earth. It is irrelevant what culture you are, etc. This chronology is going to cover every single person on this planet's true history. Now, the idea of this particular talk will be to lay down a very, very generalized chronology that covers all of the major catastrophes that punctuate planet Earth's history. Now, I'm not talking about catastrophes that happened 8 billion years ago or 300 million years ago. I'm not talking about catastrophes like that. I am talking about Earth-altering catastrophes that have happened only in the past few thousand years upwards to maybe 10-ish thousand years ago. The catastrophes that we are going to point out really fast in this chronology are terrible, horrifically crazy, insane events that our ancestors witnessed and some survived to tell the tales. Now, modern day scholarship, modern day academia, these people completely ignore all of this stuff that our ancestors have recorded. The reason, and the reason why is simple, right? All of the stuff that we are going to be covering here in this short version of the chronology, I am going to try to keep it short, I will do my best, but everything we're going to cover here, mainstream thinks is just fantasy and insanity. Mainstream does not pay attention to any of these stories that our ancestors dubiously and religiously recorded and tried to pass down to us now. So, I mean, what does that even say about the mainstream establishment that they're not willing to listen to and take seriously all of these cultures around the world that report living through and dealing with all of these crazily destructive events? All right, and there is, there is, there's almost nothing in anything that our ancestors talk about that is not based in a scientific reality of some sort or another. The problem comes in the fact that we find that our ancestors, well, I mean, I, you know, this could be a translation issue too, but our ancestors describe these stories in the term of things such as gods and afterlifes and, and all this weird stuff like that. And of course, in modern Western day thinking, you know, anything that is or sounds even remotely religious in any way, shape or form is immediately discarded. Academics nowadays obviously find it out of fashion to read a ancient text that is dealing with the gods and taking it seriously. Now, before we go any further, here is the warning that I always put in front of my videos as early as I can because social conditioning practices make it almost impossible to seriously talk about the events we are going to cover here. And one of the reasons why it makes it difficult to talk about these events is because once something is framed in a religious context, it is immediately discarded by the mainstream. And then any other data that could be found in that text is no longer looked at in any shape or form. And of course that's a weakness because there is a ton of amazing data points found in everybody's ancient histories. So if mainstream is willing to throw this stuff away, I mean, really, where does that put them in understanding a real chronology, right? It puts them at a huge disadvantage. So what we will do is we will use critical thinking skills and the scientific method when we approach history and anything that our ancestors talk about in their tales. Now, how do we start dealing with, with gods and science and stuff like that? Very, very simply. The rule on this channel is very simple. Whenever we hear our ancestors talking about gods in the sky, we replace the word God with planet. And I mean the real planet that we know, Mars, Venus, Saturn, Jupiter, etc. We know those exist. Those are real entities out there in space. 
our ancestors knew they existed as well. And for whatever reason, everybody on this planet in the past knew of the planets and they describe all kinds of events that these planets went through over time. And a lot of these events that take place cosmologically dealing with these planets, right? It's not taking place in a faraway land way out in space. Like we would, you know, we can't even find the planets right now in the, in the star-filled sky. If I were to ask you to point out Saturn, unless you're a total nerd, of which case, of course, we would pants you. But unless you're a total nerd, you're not going to find anything up there in the sky. All the planets just look like pinpricks of light. There's, there's no differentiation. But for some weird reason, our ancestors talk about planets doing all kinds of amazingly destructive stuff and, and other visual, you know, anyway, there's all kinds of crap going on up in space up there. And our ancestors talk about it. Once we get rid of the term God and replace it with planet, and then we reread those stories, suddenly those stories start to make scientific sense. But, of course, there's a problem. A lot of, or basically not a lot, everything, basically everything that our ancestors talk about sounds insane because right now when we look up at the sky, we do not look up and see Mars up there in the sky and think, wow, that's a really fiery war god. Wow, look at him. He's just going crazy. He's just fighting everything. And man, yeah, that's a war god. And you don't think that. Nobody thinks that. Nobody looks up to the sky right now at Mars and goes, oh, wow, I've been inspired by the war god because look at all the crazy war stuff this thing has done. <laughs> that, nobody is doing that. And the reason why is simple, because nothing's happening. When you see Mars up there now, it's, it's just a pinprick of light. It doesn't do anything. It is irrelevant in your life. Unless you're into astrology and then blah, blah, blah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But the point is, is that nobody cares, right? So why did our ancestors care to record all of these crazy events associated with planets? That being the case, that means when we look at ancient times... Suddenly, all of the stories that our ancestors were recording and telling make a completely different picture for us. So what we can do now, if we actually listen to our ancestors' stories, instead of ignoring them, like the mainstream, if we listen to what they say and then we apply real science against these eyewitness testimonies, suddenly an entirely different picture of our past emerges. And this, of course, completely is going to change chronology. It will have to. It necessarily will require us to look at our chronological past in a completely different light. So that's our first problem with chronology, right? No, we, nobody's taking our ancient ancestors seriously. And that's our goal. That's what we are going to do. So that's one problem with chronology. We have another problem when we deal with chronology, and that problem is that we find when we look at mainstream chronology, we find ourselves in the position of being able to prove beyond a shadow of a doubt, we can prove this 100% scientifically, that there has been a lot of obfuscation by various institutions of all of our pasts. It takes very little research and scholarship to immediately find and point out areas to where bad faith actors have gone in to our mainstream chronology and they've obfuscated dates. They have added dates. They have deleted entire events. They have duplicated and triplicated events to extend the chronology where it needed to be extended to fulfill somebody's dubious desires, I guess you could say. Basically, we find corruption all over the place when we start to look at mainstream chronology. And what that does is that that puts all of these dates that are, you know, lined up for you to look at, you know, all these time, beautiful, nice, perfectly organized timelines that the, that the textbooks and the history researchers, mainstream history researchers will place in front of you. And it looks really good. It looks really all organized. Like, oh yeah, we have a really good idea of what happened back in the Roman times or back in the Greek times or over here. Like we, it, the mainstream really does put on a fantastic show of having a good grasp of what went down in the past few thousand years. But the reality is, all it takes is like two seconds of research and then you find a lot of that stuff is absolute garbage. 
So that means we cannot trust the mainstream timeline. So what do we do with now? Okay, so what happens with that? Now, if we can't trust the mainstream timeline, then we have to trust our ancestors and we have to use real science to try to dig out real dates. Where does that put us? Well, it puts us in a pretty crappy situation, but it also puts us in a freeing situation. So if we go ahead and we get rid of the mainstream timeline, because we can, we can scientifically remove the mainstream chronology from our mind because we know for a fact that it is dubious at best, but the reality is it, it's completely corrupt garbage and we have to move on beyond it. I realize that that is going to be hard for some people because even alternative researchers, even alternative researchers still hold on to the main chronology, the mainstream chronology more or less because they believe that a lot of the dating systems that sound scientific are legit, right? That's another problem. A lot of the, all of the dating systems that we have, let's be honest, all of them, none of them are reliable. Carbon-14 dating, dendrochronology, etc., etc. None of these dates are reliable because of the way they are gained. It's not, anyway, there's, that's, all right, we're not going to get into that. Let, let's get into the chronology. All right, so that means we need a different chronology. If we are going to study the ancient past with any kind of hope of figuring out what the hell happened back in the day, we need to establish a real chronology. And that's what we are going to do now. I know, 12 hours later, we get to it. All right, so we're going to start at the beginning and we're going to then create an anchor point for us. And then we'll go over the, the punctuated dates of where we think currently the main cataclysms that affected humanity happened that led us to where we are now. So it'll we're only going to cover three three and a half cataclysms. There, there's three and let's, let's say three and a half. There's three and a half cataclysms that truly truly mess with humanity and the planet Earth and alters everything forever from that point on. Once they hit, we're not going to go into the little, into the little micro cataclysms that would have been going down constantly on Earth because while those would have sucked and I'm sure we actually lost entire civilizations here and there because of the smaller fallout cataclysms, those cataclysms are nowhere near as damaging as the three and a half cataclysms we are going to cover. Now, the point of going over only these three and a half cataclysms that happened really quick is because they are such staples in chronology and they change everything. These are the main areas I want people to understand are basically tent poles of our chronology because tons of events that, ha that, that take place are because of these main cataclysms that strike Earth. And once you start to factor in these cataclysms, Suddenly, history, like human migration, human innovation, all of, you know, genetics, all of this kind of stuff starts to take on an entirely different picture, but it's a picture backed up by science, and it makes sense once we just start following the evidence. And that's exactly what chronology should be. Chronology should not be this weird made-up garbage thing to where people are averaging out dates to come up with, with the true facts. Like, oh, go, don't even get me started on that crap. Like, for example, did you know, like, the King's List of Egypt? That, those dates are literally an average of two different opinions on when that stuff happened. Did you know that? Yeah, it's, it's, it's ridiculous. It's insane. Anything I say for this chronology, by the way, dealing with planets and all this insanity, it is not even close to the insane things that the mainstream believes and that the mainstream takes as fact like the mainstream chronologist i don't even know if there is a mainstream does, does mainstream chronology even exist outside of people just having their focused areas like i don't even know anyway the mainstream is insane with their conclusions right now the problem is is that that insanity has been projected on the entire western world for so long that we now find ourselves in a position to where if something is re if a lie is repeated long enough and consistently enough people will believe the lie and that is exactly the position that mainstream chronology finds itself in right now right every you know you you're you're damned if you if you question the mainstream chronology in a mainstream arena, what happens to you, right? You're kicked out, you're ostracized, you know, you get pushed away, you're called a crazy conspiracy theorist and all that, blah, blah, blah. You know, it's insane. These people, they don't care about facts. They care about their careers. They care about the power that they have that, you know, that's what they care. Okay. You all know that. All right. All right. 
let's lay the foundations of our new chronology so that we have a better general understanding of where we're at when we talk about other events on this channel. And of course, you can apply this to anything. Once, once you have these, these basic pieces, you know, apply it to your ancient historical studies, you'll be surprised about how things change and how events that may have not made any sense originally suddenly make perfect scientific sense. That's what we want. We want scientific sense. Get on with it, bitch. We want to hear about your stupid chronology. Yeah, all right. It's coming. All right. So we have to start at the beginning. The beginning is an unfortunate situation for our chronology because I do not actually have a date for the very beginning or what we would call our anchor point in the new chronology. So what do I mean by that? So here's the deal. The very first event that we will anchor our chronology to will be the deluge. Now, remember, all of you militant atheists out there, remember, I don't believe in God, so we're not talking about a deluge sent by God. All right, no, no religious stuff needed, so don't forget that. We're going to start with the deluge because all ancient cultures that go back to a certain point have a deluge. And this deluge really is the beginning point for pretty much everybody across these cultures. I mean, you might be saying, well, don't they have stuff before that? Yes, and let's cover that really quick as well. So the, the anchor point we will have will be the deluge, but does that mean, but, but what the hell happened before the deluge? I mean, there's gotta be a time frame, you know, pre-deluge that matters. And I agree completely, it 100% matters. Why am I not gonna worry about it in our chronology? The reason why I'm not going to try to give dates for anything that happened in this supposed golden age is because we don't have any dates. So here's the, here's the quick recap for those of you who are not quite sure what this golden age is. It's very interesting. Cultures all over this planet, when they, you know, when you go back and you start to look at their mythologies, the one of, you know, you're going to find all kinds of similarities in the first place, right? So comparative mythology is extremely important. And when we employ comparative mythology, we find all kinds of data points lining up all over the planet. One of the data points that we find is the deluge. That'll be our anchor point. But there's also stories about what comes before the deluge in all of these cultures more or less and what are these stories so these stories talk about a golden age all of them they all talk about a time to where the planet earth was essentially completely different than where we find it now or how we find it now back in the day if we if we want to you know if we're going to listen to our ancestors they all make the claim that prior to the deluge Planet Earth was essentially a paradise. A paradise in the truest sense, by the way. Right, we're talking about lush vegetation covering the entire you know, planet from everybody's perspective anyway. All ancient cultures talk about this. No, no ancient culture talks about the golden age being a desert of nothing. Everybody talks about the planet being this lush, amazing place. Humans had no concept of war, greed, famine, etc. because those concepts didn't, there was no point to having them. They didn't need to exist. There's no, there was no reason for any of that to exist because nobody wanted for anything. So if everybody had everything supplied and everybody was just chilling, having fun and being groovy, then great, fantastic, that's great. Everybody's helping each other out, just living, enjoying life, no problems, right? So that's what everybody describes. The problem with the Golden Age is this. A, there's nothing really going on that punctuates any events. Like I said, nobody's, nobody's wasting their time with wars or kings or, or anything like that. There, there's no reason for any of that back in the day because humans apparently, according to all of these stories, you know, apparently humans just didn't know about this stuff. It's very interesting, actually. I've always wondered if you could take a, somehow do an experiment where you grab a baby and just kind of let it grow up on its own. Does it automatically figure out war, greed, and all of that stuff? Or does that have to be taught to the human? I, I don't know. Anyway, just a side thing. Point is, is that humans, there's, there's nothing going on with any kind of dates that we know of. Even more interesting, it's not just that we don't have these punctuated events in the Golden Age. It doesn't seem like anybody needed to tell time anyway. Right? There's no reason to tell time for these people. Interestingly enough... What we find is that it's, it's not that nobody wants to tell time because there's no reason to in the sense of it doesn't matter. I don't have to be anywhere by 6 o'clock, so why would I design and build a clock? There's no reason for that. 
that's not why not at least one of the, one of the reasons that's one of the not reasons why they didn't keep time the other reason why they didn't keep time did that make sense they didn't keep time because they didn't need to that let me rephrase that i know got schizo there okay but the other reason why these people did not have to keep time was because there was no concept of day or night allegedly this is what the stories say now if we apply real science to this we know that earth if, if we're going to follow the evidence all right so i'm i'm going to preface this for everything i say from now here and out everything i mention is backed by some sort of science and some sort of history so now we're going to get into the crazy schizo stuff sort that's not, not schizo you know, it's, it's the real stuff it's just going to sound schizo but we're going to get into it now and i'm just going to say it and i'm and i'm not going to back too much of it up in this video because i just want to get through the basic chronology all right so we've established that you know humans back in the day they were cool everybody was happy slapping each other on the butt no problems uh, golden age earth was lush scientifically speaking we know for a fact that at some period in the past that yes the earth was indeed extremely more lush than it is nowadays in fact you can even make a very 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 good argument i don't even think it's an argument i think it's just an established fact at this point that the earth we live on now in its current form is absolutely impoverished is absolutely trash compared to what it was only five six ten thousand years ago right it, it, it's it's unbelievable but the evidence is there right and and this is exactly what we would expect to find actually if we are going to listen to our ancestors and the events that they describe actually happened all right so fine how what goes down what's happening here so what we find is we find earth in a completely different situation cosmologically than what mainstream will even come close to alluding to the situation earth finds itself in only a few thousand years ago and and in, in this case it would be five six ten plus thousand years ago at least what we find is that earth was not orbiting our current sun still with me gets crazier earth was orbiting saturn only a few thousand years ago yeah i know that sounds totally schizo initially especially because the amount of damage the theory of uniformity has done to all of us what do i mean that the earth was orbiting saturn what the hell am i talking about so here's the deal here's the picture if we're to believe our ancestors like i said 5 10 12 thousand years ago earth was orbiting saturn when saturn was what we would call a brown dwarf star if this is the case what happens if you have planets orbiting in a brown dwarf's plasma sheath apparently what we find is that that plasma sheath will cover and blanket whatever planets locked inside of it with a general uniform warmth a general uniform warmth would of course be very conducive to life on this planet if the entire if the entire earth is blanketed in a general nice temperature right all kinds of stuff could grow everywhere that suddenly starts to make things make more sense when we look at archaeological findings up north and up south, right? Right, because right now we don't really have good explanations for it. Right now, plate tectonics gets the credit for all these stupid discoveries or all these movements. It's good discoveries, not stupid discoveries. The discoveries are awesome. It's a stupid explanation for these discoveries. Plate tectonics is trash. We don't even need it. We don't need any of it. Our ancestors don't describe it. There's no reason to believe they exist. That's a whole other show in and of itself. But there, there's no reason for it. Planet Earth at this point in time is essentially a paradise for all of life because it is orbiting Saturn while Saturn was a brown dwarf star and if earth was enveloped in its plasma sheath now here is where our problem of time comes into play and why i can't give any dates i'm not saying that people aren't doing that and haven't done good work out there i just haven't seen it and i don't even know how you could anyways because here's the problem if earth is indeed orbiting within brown dwarf saturn's plasma sheet 
that means that people can't see space. There's no concept of stars at this point in time, which is interesting because if you think about it, the further back you go in our ancestors' histories, stars don't play any role. You can actually pinpoint areas to where people start to see stars. So Earth's current position in our chronology, right now Earth can't see outside of that plasma sheath. That plasma sheath is opaque, and it's like supposed to be a bluish, reddish, purplish looking glow. So what we find ourselves here is when we find our ancestors talking about, you know, these, these purple dawn situations, etc. Right? That would make sense because we would find planet Earth within that plasma sheath and that's exactly what they would see. Even more interesting is that if a planet is within that plasma sheath, <clears throat> it's being radiated heat equally on all parts of the planet. So that's nice, a nice even heat. So that's great for plants. But the plants and life on Earth are also getting a heavy dose of red light spectrum energy. And that's what plants truly love. It's essentially an amazing, awesome, you know, lit greenhouse basically is what Earth was. It's almost like Earth was an incubator for life very specifically. And I'm not going to go any further into that, but it is a very, very interesting concept. Because that is where our ancestors found their ancient ancestors at this point in time. Okay, fine. There's a golden age, but that doesn't start our chronology. So start the chronology, dude. What the hell? Okay, so <clears throat> what happens is at some point, the golden age comes to an unbelievably crushing, disastrous end. Now, one more part of the picture we have to paint for everybody. We have Earth orbiting Saturn within its plasma sheath. People on Earth cannot see stars. Fantastic. But... What they can see are several other planets. Earth is not just orbiting Saturn as if, uh, you know, as if we would see bodies orbiting the sun nowadays. By all accounts, and this is, th this is where there's a couple different viewpoints, and I'll just give one of them. But at some point in time, when Earth is orbiting around Saturn within the plasma sheath, it is polar locked to the south pole of Saturn. All right, of the interior of Saturn. But planet Earth is not the only planet locked at the South Pole. We also find Mars and another planet locked at the South Pole. Now, that other planet is generally considered Venus. Now, I'm not going to go too crazy into this because we, there's, there's a lot of questions and there's a lot of chaos that goes down. But essentially... Earth was just one in a chain of planets that were polar locked to the South Pole. So everybody's nice and lined up beneath Saturn, right? Everybody's happy. Everybody's partying. All the planets are fine. Nothing's going on until, until Saturn runs into our current sun. This is where we will start our chronology. Now, what am I talking about? When did Saturn run into the sun? Wouldn't both planets or, or systems or whatever be absolutely destroyed if they ran into each other? Correct. When I say run into each other, let me clarify. So, scientifically speaking, what, what has been discovered nowadays is that we no longer need dark energy, dark matter. We don't need any of that relativity theory garbage anymore. We can actually start to explain celestial mechanics with plasma physics and electromagnetism all of, all of those those sciences right there that explains so much of what we see cosmologically that it completely invalidates the in the need for any kind of ridiculous insane like dark energy or dark matter or whatever else garbage things they come with up with nowadays we don't need any of that crap it's garbage it's theoretical anyways and it's theoretical trash so we're going to discard it because we don't need it what we have now found scientifically is that basically electricity rules everything plasma is everything that's essentially it and we're not going to go crazy into this part just want to just want to get a couple little science pieces out there so you understand that this is not totally schizo and that it is indeed backed up by real science and new science and it's not even really new it's been around for a while it's just the mainstream ignores it all right moving on so what happens is, is that when Saturn is in its brown dwarf state, and please remember, Saturn did not look like Saturn does nowadays. There was no ring system. It didn't, it didn't have its belts and bands that we find now. The way we find Saturn now is because 
We find Saturn in its current situation now because of what is about to happen. So what happens is, is that Saturn as a brown dwarf has an electromagnetic sheath that's going around it, right? An electromagnetic field, sorry. It has an electromagnetic field. We know they exist. They're there. The sun has one as well. What happens when two electromagnetic fields touch each other, especially if they are charged opposites? Well, they attract, don't they? And this is what happens. The sun's magnetic field and Saturn in its brown dwarf phase magnetic field, those magnetic fields touch at a certain point. Once those magnetic fields collide, that is when all hell begins to break loose. Why? Because, well, what does electricity want to do? Electricity wants to take a volatile, an environment to where it, it's not stable and it wants to stabilize itself. It is self-organizing. And that's exactly what starts to happen. So when all of that entire electrical environment starts to try to self-organize, Earth is now along for the ride. Now, here's what happens. Here is where we get to the deluge. I know, 30 plus minutes into this stupid talk and we're gonna make the very first chronological point. All right, here we go. The interaction between these two bodies, the sun and brown dwarf Saturn, this is what will trigger the deluge to take place. How does that happen? Briefly, I'm not gonna get into all the crazy stuff. That's for other shows. And, and, no, I, you know what, two other points really quick before we go through this whole thing. Another point is, is that while Earth is within this plasma sheath in Saturn, it is also constantly being gently misted upon. Uh, apparently, and this has been discovered by NASA, this is not schizo stuff, brown dwarf stars generate water. They create water molecules, right? So if you're a planet within that plasma sheath, you're going to be constantly getting a very nice mist of rain. And this rain would have been generated by the reactions of, of, of the brown dwarf Saturn around Earth. So Earth is constantly getting this, this, Earth essentially is a perfect greenhouse. Like I said, it's just crazy, man. It's too perfect, if you ask me. Very, very interesting. Anyway, now the other quick note I wanted to say is that the the sun our current sun that sun was involved in a binary system before saturn showed up and the binary star to the sun was jupiter jupiter would have also been in some sort of a brown or red dwarf stage as well and of course jupiter also has an electromagnetic field and would have been included in this car accident as all of these you know stars basically collide with one another electrically it's very important for everybody to understand actually when you'll hear the word collision a lot when you start to get into this entire electric universe plasma physics situation they're not talking about two solid bodies you know colliding together they're not saying that the earth and, and saturn smashed each other physically they are talking about the electromagnetic fields touching and messing with each other no collisions between planets as far as i can tell happened well I, okay it gets weird but that's not for this video anyway just a heads up when people talk about collisions they're talking about electromagnetic fields all right so we have the binary system of the sun jupiter they're happy campers they're just chilling out there doing their orbital thing saturn is doing its orbital thing is saturn a binary system i do not know i don't have an answer for that but the the saturnian system it, at least Earth, Earth, Mars, and Venus were for sure part of that system. We, we can say that with some confidence now, but the, and there's more to it. Anyway, so once the Saturnian system and the solar system, or the sun system, whatever, these two basically collide. When they collide, there's all kinds of reactions taking place, especially electrically. One of the things that begins to happen is that Earth and the other planets that were locked at the south pole of Saturn, we get broken up. This is where the Golden Age essentially ends. So that orbit, we planets are just shot out, basically. Well, I, I, we don't know exactly the exact movements of how everything would have happened, but the orbits get broken up. And, and some of these things are actually described here and there. Anyway, the Golden Age, this is where the Golden Age dies, because Earth is kicked out of the brown dwarf Saturn. Not only is Earth kicked out of being in the plasma sheath of Saturn, Saturn itself goes through one hell of a change. And we see the results of that change nowadays when we look at Saturn. So, for Saturn to get to that point, what goes on? Well, 
Earth gets kicked out, Saturn starts freaking out, and in the process of all of this freak out, and there's a lot of stuff going on, we're just trying to stick to the basics here, so I can get to the point eventually. Out of all of this, what we find is that Earth, when it's getting kicked out, gets inundated with rain. Where does this rain come from? It comes from space. I, You know, I kicked myself when I heard this. I was so pissed. Because whenever anybody hears about the deluge, and we'll go into this more later in some other show, shows probably, but it pisses me off because it's like the first problem with the deluge is where the hell did the water come from? And I never thought for two seconds, oh yeah, it could have come from space. You know, where there's all kinds of crap out there in space to what could absolutely annihilate Earth in like two seconds. You know, space. Yeah, space, this is what's going on. So one of the reactions is that is that Earth gets inundated with Saturnian water. And scientifically, to the point, Saturn's water signature, its atomic water signature, matches up with Earth's. So there is a scientific basis to believe that Earth and Saturn shared some sort of the exact same source of water. Right? Cosmologists don't want to talk about that. That's just like some factoid, interesting factoid on social media and then everybody forgets it. That's one hell of a claim. That's one hell of an amazing scientific discovery. Another thing is that we find the salt on Earth matches this chemical signature on Saturn as well. Very, very interesting. Things get... Anyway, there's lots of stuff like that. I'm not going to go into it. So, basically, the Golden Age ends because Earth starts to go for one hell of a ride and the deluge happens during this ride. Now, the deluge covers the entire planet with water. That's the story. One of the things that we really need to remember is that Earth at this point in time in our chronology, it does not look like Earth today in any sense of the word, almost, almost. What we find, the, the geography that we find on Earth now is created from events like this and then some of the other huge catastrophic events that take place after this. So when the claim is, is that even the highest mountain peak was covered with water, we have no reason to believe that mountain peaks were all that high during this point in time. In fact, we, we would be relegated to possibly looking something like Venus back in the day. Venus right now is a very, relatively speaking, a very smooth planet. It does not have huge high peaks. It does not have tons of craters. It doesn't have any of that. The reason why is because, well, Venus isn't that old. I don't know how, Earth, how old Earth is either, but back in the day, we know that there were a lot of geological features, and this is, geology has proved this, ironically, that existed that exists now that did not exist just like 10,000 years ago. Now that's another show on in and of itself, but these are scientific facts. I don't know what to tell you. This is what the science says. This is what the mainstream science says, interestingly enough. Geologists just love to ignore it or place and a couple extra zeros on the end of the years that they discover stuff on, right? Because nothing can happen unless it's billions of years old in geology. Absolutely insane people of geologists. Anyway, so when we hear stories or recountings of the water covering even the highest mountain peak, I mean, if the highest mountain peak is only a thousand feet at this point in time, not a big deal. I mean, it could, it could really look like that from these people's perspectives. Easy, no problem. And they probably could have actually seen waters that were pretty damn high in certain areas. The earth was literally inundated. Now, I also realize that the stories talk about, you know, the deeps or the depths of earth opening up and allowing water to burst forward as well. Very interesting. I don't have anything to say on that scientifically. I mean, we know that there's water in the ground, obviously, but how you squeeze water out of the ground during a situation like this, scientifically, I don't know. But it's there. I mean, so that contributes as well to the flooding. You know, what do you want from me? It's there. Anyway, Earth gets flooded. So this brings us to our first chronological date. And, ironically enough, I do not have a date. You like that? We're going to start our anchor point in chronology without a chronological date. Here's the problem. I do not know when the deluge happened. Like I said, the people that were before the deluge who lived in, in the antediluvian times, they didn't keep records like that, or at least not that we found or anything to that extent. I, I, and I have not seen anybody come forward with any kind of a solid date for anything back before the deluge. This means that whenever the deluge hit, 
you know, we don't have a specific date. Now, I know that sucks, but we have at the very least probably a range of a date. So the range of the date of the deluge from what all of my research has shown so far, and I fully expect this to change because that's how science operates. And I do not have a pet theory, by the way, but our anchor chronological date to where everything begins and we're gonna begin it with the deluge, we have to say, I'm, I'm willing to say something like maybe, you know, 5,000 years to 12 to 15,000 years ago would have been the deluge's point. That's not a great way to start a chronology. I understand that, but it's an honest way. We just have to place the deluge somewhere in there and then we have to let things, you know, history take place and, and things go on up until the next catastrophe. So only 5,000 to 12 to 15,000 years ago, Earth was orbiting Saturn. That's the claim backed up by science and history at the moment. Now, we're still developing all this, so, you know, don't, you know, it, it's... This is where we're at so far where the evidence has led us. All right, so that's our beginning chronological date. The next date that matters, the next event that takes place that alters human history and the planet Earth forever is what we will call the Venus event. Now, remember when I said the Saturnian system hit the, the, the solar system, you know, the Earth or sorry, the, the Sun-Jupiter binary system electrically, Everybody gets shot out. All the planets go into chaos, blah, blah, blah. And there would be a lot of chaos because we do not know. We don't know what else was going on in the Jupiter-Sun binary. There could have been other planets in there that we now see that were not part of the Saturnian. It, it's, it's a jumbled mess right now. And while there are trains of evidence to follow, that's not part of this video. I don't even know what I'm talking about. Just, just there's a lot of chaos, okay? A lot of crap happens. Now... The, the interesting thing about electricity is that electricity will self-organize and it happens quickly. One of the offenses you're probably feeling right now is the fact that it's, I'm claiming that the solar system, you know, if you take me at face value right now, that the solar system was 100% completely different only five to 12,000 years ago. And instead of it taking billions of years to get into an organized state that we find now, I'm basically claiming it only took a few thousand years, and yes, that's the claim. That claim is backed up by science. That claim is backed up by plasma physics and electromagnetics, right? Electricity sorts itself quickly. This does not take a billion years. Electricity gets to the, the, the neutral point as quickly as possible, and the good news here is that the electric force, the electromagnetic force, is one of the strongest forces known in existence. Gravity is literally nothing compared to the electromagnetic force. So if you're thinking, you know, everybody has to think in terms of gravity, the weakest force, one of the weakest forces that we essentially know, gravity is nothing but we blame everything on the weakest force? Are you out of your mind? I mean, this is why mainstream people are insane. It takes two seconds to see electromagnetics just can absolutely dominate everything in a room, makes gravity non-existent, and then we're not going to admit that electromagnetics isn't taking place in space, even though we know for a fact that we have magnetic fields all over the place out in space. It's, it's just ridiculous. You don't need dark matter. You do not need dark energy. You don't need any of that crap. All you need is plasma physics and basically electric universe stuff. And it starts to solve everything. All right. Anyway, so for those of you who are wondering why it doesn't take 10 billion years to sort the planet system, it's because we have electromagnetics on our side. We don't need gravity. Gravity's there. Gravity's just an expression of electricity, by the way. But we don't need gravity's not the, the main force here. And why would it be? It's the weakest force. It's pathetic. When you have the electromagnetic force acting, it does not play around. It takes care of business and it just starts slapping people. Just, ah, ah, just slap. Ah. That's what it does. Gravity is garbage. Okay, anyway. So, the next event that we come to in our chronology is the Venus event. Now, we have all the... After that car accident, basically, that both systems are, are currently experiencing, Earth finds itself basically in a huge ping pong shooting gallery to where you have all kinds of planets and debris and gases and, and, and just like, you know, all kinds of crap going all around trying to sort itself out. During this sorting period, Earth will begin to have run ins with all kinds of stuff, but it has run ins with some of the planets that we know. The very first planet that causes Earth a direct problem, 
and literally changes the face of Earth is Venus. Now, the next point in our chronology will be taking place and this is the mainstream chronology, by the way. This, this is what, you know, we're dealing with mainstream chronology. I was debating on whether or not I would give the new chronology timeline as well. But for now, let's just, let's just hang out with mainstream chronological dating system just to get everybody up to speed. We'll get into the other stuff in a completely different show. So if we utilize the current, although fraudulent, mainstream timeline, the year and date, that Earth begins to have a problem with Venus would be between the 14th century BC and the 16th, 17th ish century BCE. Yes, that means only like 3,000 ish, almost 4,000 ish years ago, Earth and Venus have a close encounter. Not only do they have just one close encounter, they apparently have several close encounters, or, or maybe even many, if you really want to get into it. And these encounters were extraordinarily destructive. During this period of time, this is why we find cultures all over the world tracking and talking about Venus. And Venus is not a happy person during this period of time. Venus is a destructive entity. So you'll start to find all kinds of gods during this point in time, or in, in, in cultures all over the place during this time, they all start to suddenly have destructive stories about the planet Venus. Why? Well, apparently Venus, while Venus is trying to get to the orbit that we see now, while it's doing that, apparently it crosses over the orbit of Earth multiple times. This is why you find ancient cultures having all these weird doomsday kind of religions, etc. back during this time period. This is why you find the Mayans suddenly, they're trying to keep an eye on Venus because they were used to Venus showing up and absolutely wiping everybody out every time Venus crossed the path of Earth. Right, this, this is what happened. Now, during this time period between the 1400s and 1700s BCE, Venus crosses Earth multiple times at intervals of it looks like between 58 and 48 years per, per encounter for several times. And this lines up with calendars that we find that don't make any sense because obviously Venus's orbit was not like that. It's not like that now, but it was like that back then. This is why when uh, historians and archaeologists, they find these weird calendars or they, they find all these cultures tracking planets that their orbits have nothing to do with the orbits of today. But everybody back in the day were, were confirming with one another that, that that's the orbit that they were experiencing back then. Right? So if we listen to the, those stories and we look at the data and take it seriously, that means between every 48 and 52 years, Venus would come close to Earth. Now, when Venus comes close to Earth, every time, every time it gets close enough, there are interactions between the two planets. Right? So both planets have an electromagnetic field. Those fields talk once they touch. And then once again, all hell breaks loose again, and both planets affect one another, like horrifically, right? This is where the Venus event is where we start to find huge mountain ranges like the Andes being ripped up overnight, right? And this corresponds with all of the stories that we have. The Andes, there, nobody talks about the Andes back in the day taking billions of years to show up. Everybody back in the day down there in South America was like, those mountains got ripped up by that god, and that's how that happened. And of course, what's even more interesting is that the geology proves this 100%. It's just something that academics refuse to acknowledge, and they have to add tons of other zeros to these dates they get because they don't have any other way of getting mountain making to happen, right? We don't even, you know, it's funny as a side note, everybody probably thinks that we understand how mountains are made. We actually have no idea how mountains are made. There is no scientifically provable evidence that, that science right now, mainstream science has come up with that conclusively proves how mountains show up. In fact, it's even funnier that if you believe in te plate tectonics and, and, and the theory of uniformity, erosion would ensure that mountains could never rise high enough because erosion would just be getting rid of them. As they rise, 
slowly over billions of years, they would also be being eroded over billions of years. You actually literally need catastrophism in mainstream geology for pretty much anything to happen anyways, right? And, and, and geologists, you know, actually to a large degree will say, yeah, a cataclysm happened, but it happened like 10 billion years ago, bro. It didn't happen, you know, recently, like everybody says, like all of our ancestors report constantly. No, but let's ignore them. Let's just believe the garbage that some professor bought. Okay, you know what I mean. Like, it's ridiculous. It's stupid. Anyway, the science is there. What do you want from me? But this is the period of time in our chronology that we find Earth going through some incredibly destructive Earth-altering events. Now, during this time, when Venus does its pass-bys, it, it, it's causing huge you know, mounds of water to, to flow over the planet. There's volcanoes, floods, rain, all kinds of crazy weather, typhoon, typhoons all over the place. That's a whole amazing, interesting situation. Anyway, all hell breaks loose every time Venus does a pass by on Earth. And the reason why it's passing by Earth is because it's trying to get to its current orbit. And Earth is in the way of that a few times. All right, so we have that date established. So we go Golden Age, which we don't really have a good year for. Then we have the Deluge, somewhere probably between five to 15,000 years, somewhere in there is, is the Deluge. And then we get to the Venus event, 1400 BC to 1700 BC, multiple encounters. Then after that, Venus kind of goes away, right? Because its orbit eventually gets settled. Eventually people stop talking about and they stop fearing Venus. And then we see civilizations regrowing once again, once Venus is no longer destroying the planet every time it passes by, right? This is actually funny. This is one of the reasons why you find that civilization took so long to get where we are now. It's not because our ancestors were stupid monkeys or something. It's because they were constantly having everything destroyed at regular intervals at certain points in history. It's hilarious. I couldn't even imagine that. You can't do anything because you're like, well, it doesn't matter. You can build that building, but Venus is just going to come along and shake it to the ground and ruin and kill everything. So who cares, right? Th that keeps all of humanity down. It's, it's hilarious. Mm, sort of. There's other stuff going on too, but we'll cover that later. Okay. Next, okay, so that's two events. Deluge, Venus event. The next event that shows up that messes with Earth on a large scale and actually may be the event that gives us our current geographical tilt position and that event is what we will call the Mars event. Now, this event takes place somewhere around the 700s BCE. This would also correspond with the stories of the Iliad. The Iliad actually records the events and the doings and the deeds of the god Ares. Ares is Mars. And this is, of course, what we find all over the planet. There is a point in time in everybody who survived history that Mars is suddenly a feared god. The reason why Mars is a feared god is because Earth begins to have a couple of interactions with Mars. Probably for the same kind of reason that it gets has interactions with Venus, Mars is also still trying to find its orbit. During this period of time, Earth runs into Mars. Once again, not physically. During these events, this may be why Mars has such a weak magnetic field and it's probably also directly why we find Mars in the state that we find it. Here's what happens. During this event, Mars comes close enough to Earth to where people are able to see the features on the planet. Now, this is a fact, right? There are cultures all over this planet that have no problem describing, for example, the huge scar on Mars, Valles Marineris. This is a fact. Why, why do the North American Indians call Mars the scarred god? Even more interesting, how do they even, how do, why do they have a story of where it even came from? Well, it's, it's fascinating when you read these, these histories is that not only do they know what the planet looks like now, but they knew how it got some of its more striking features. They actually have stories about that. How do you like that? Like, what do you even do with that as a mainstream historian that comes across these stories? Uh, it, it, actually, I know exactly what happens. You can see it on YouTube all the time. You see these professors and stuff talking about North American history or their mythologies, I guess I should say, 
from their perspective and it's it's absolute cope and it is completely disrespectful to the culture it's jesus anyway during this period of time earth runs into mars now when earth and mars run into each other we find a situation to where mars is at least close enough to where it literally is able to grab onto earth and bow earth low quote unquote there is a time to where earth actually gets its geographical tilt permanently changed by mars now this is interesting because this is why we find huge civil or ruins of huge civilizations in areas to where there's really no reason anybody should ever have been able to live so for example egypt egypt's the best one egypt is now you know it's just a desert it's a straight sand desert out there. i mean there's you know there's features and stuff like that but north africa you know it's a desert area no questions about it how the hell do you build structures like the pyramid and all of the temples and have a civilization like that? And there's others as well along North Africa, right, that, that are given credit to Greeks and Romes, Romans. Anyway, all kinds of stuff up there. But the reality is the environment of that area does not is not conducive for a civilization like that to thrive. And, and it's not. The reason why those civilizations eventually become ghost towns and why they become ruins is because at a certain point in time, Egypt was at a different latitude, and I believe it's a three degree difference. That being Egypt being three degrees up further north. What that does is that puts Egypt in a more temperate environment area, which means that you could have had a very nice lush area taking place there to where you could have a huge civilization building pyramids. You know, I'm not, I have no idea who built the pyramids. I'm not getting into that. But it definitely helps if you have a place that's actually livable, right? Regardless. And that's what Egypt would have had prior to the Mars event. So when Mars passes close by, one of the times it, it passes by close, this is where we have Earth's orbit being changed again. Venus also messes with Earth's orbit, by the way. This is why you find different calendars. We, we find all these weird calendars in antiquity, and they don't make sense to us. Right? We, we find calendars with 240 days, 360 days. You know, and, and archaeologists are scratching their head going, are these people just dumb? I mean, what, what's going on? I mean, they're, they're calculating calendars, but they're wrong. I mean, you can't use them for anything as a calendar, but they're very clearly calendars. So you, what do you do with a calendar that's technically wrong all the time or a timekeeping piece that's, that's wrong all the time? It doesn't correspond with how we find Earth today. And the reason why it does not correspond or any of these ancient calendars do not correspond with what we see today is because the Earth's orbit was different, its spin axis was different, all of this stuff was different. And the way Earth is nowadays is a direct result of these close encounters with these other planets all right so mars comes along there's even electrical bolts that are shared between mars and and earth at this point in time we also have some atmosphere being shared as well now this is also probably the period of time where mars loses its electromagnetic field now mars is not the only player in this cosmological dance we also find Venus, for some weird reason, is taking part. Yeah, it's interesting to note that at this period of time, nobody is afraid of Venus. Everybody is absolutely terrified of Venus back during the, the 1400s to the 1700s. Everybody. Everybody's tracking it. Everybody's afraid. But as time passes and as Venus goes away, nobody cares about Venus anymore. Now, when the Mars event takes place, Venus is still acting in some form or another but for whatever reason it does not appear like any culture really cares about venus nobody's worried about venus at this point in time everybody's worried about mars but we do have descriptions of venus up there in the sense of troy this would be Pallas athene up there fighting with with aries mars right we we find these stories Nobody's, but nobody's worried about Venus. So that, that leads us to believe that Venus was far enough away to where there was no, it had to be far enough away to, nobody was worried about it. Mars was the, the interjector here. But Venus is acting on Mars as well. So we have three planets kind of duking it out. 
Mars is basically in the middle. What's going on here, if you know the descriptions are to be believed, is that Venus essentially zaps the crap out of out, out of Mars several times. This is probably where Valles Marineris comes from. Quick side note: Valles Marineris has been pretty dang close to being scientifically proven to be an electrical scar. And what do we find during this period of time of our ancestors talking about these two planets? We find these planets are indeed exchanging thunderbolts. So, and, and they even describe it very clearly that Venus literally beats the crap out of Mars. I mean, Mar Venus apparently was the victor in all of these fights when they start describing, you know, this battle and stuff going on in the sky. So ultimately, Mars messes with Earth in the sense that it pulls us down into a different uh, latitudinally, latitude, is that even a word, latitudinally? Lati our, the latitude is shifted because Mars's influence on Earth permanently changes that tilt. Now, we still, we, we've had our 23 degree and, and change tilt this entire time, apparently, you know, which would match, uh, you know, Saturn and Venus, etc. That's one of the reasons why we all have the same tilt is because we were all part of the same solar system at some point in time back in the day. Uh, but Mars comes along and, and screws with the geographic tilt even further. When it does this, there are several horrific events that take place. The first one is that you have all kinds of uh, typhoons, hurricanes, etc. Again, earthquakes all over the place. You have tsunamis. And you also find that cultures who used to live in one kind of a natural environment due to the change in the direction or the tilt of the geogra geography of Earth, suddenly you are now in an area that is not so hospitable anymore. And this would explain why we find all kinds of ruins of ancient civilizations who could not have lived in the areas that we currently find their ruins, right? It's not possible at all. All right, so you, you get it. Basically, Earth has another encounter with a planet during the 700-ish BCE time, 6 to 700-ish, you can even argue 550 to 700-ish BC. You know, it, it, the air is a little weird. In mainstream chronology, you have this event. All right, so that, that's, I'm not going to get into all the details. That's for other shows. But so right now we have, quick recap, we have the deluge happens between 5 and 12, 15,000 years ago. Then the next event that, that punctuates chronology is the Venus event. 1400-ish to 1700-ish BC. Then we have the Mars event, 550-ish BC to 800-ish BC. Several encounters probably there as well. Now, that's our three main, those are our three main catastrophes that I wanted to cover. The next one I wanted to go over is one that I don't hear many people talking about all that much because I do not think that we truly understand what's going on because it is so close to us now relative to chronology that it seems like it's impossible that even catastrophists can even shy away from this a little bit but i'm going to cover it anyways because it's something i've been researching and digging more and more into and it's unbelievably fascinating and and that event would be this at some point around 100 ish a.d it seems like we have one more event with a comet that flies pretty dang close to Earth. And when it does this, this comet around this period of time is the comet or, or is the event that is responsible for the destruction of things like the Mayans, for the destruction of quite a few cultures up there in the British Isles and the Siberian area. The trajectory of this comet goes across Earth from south, what, southwest to northeast basically anything in this path of this comet gets absolutely annihilated land masses are messed with not continental sized land masses but huge land mass areas like this is probably where we find maybe maybe where the north sea comes from we do find that the mediterranean is absolutely destroyed by this comet this is where you start to hear things like about justinian's comet basically right this is where you hear about plagues the problem with mainstream chronology is that it takes all of these events and it spreads them out over a 800 year period this is fake chronology 
real chronology would basically demand, it would make sense anyways, that all of those crazy events that, that the Mediterranean records, for example, you know, shores going underwater, other land parts raising out of water, plagues, you know, fires, hurricanes, destruction, and mass tsunamis. We have all of these crazy events that take place, and, and historians are fine with it, by the way, that's part of the history, but because they've spread them out over almost a thousand years, it, it takes away the glamour, but it doesn't even do that, in my opinion. If you're going to say that you have all these kind of crazy events going on that close in our history, we should probably pay a lot more attention to it, but they don't. It's just kind of weird footnotes, and they just kind of, yeah, whatever. That shore sank, and yeah, it was a small earthquake, and we just moved on. Shut up. You don't lose part of a shore, an entire shore with an entire city in it, and just move on. That's a pretty big deal. Anyway, this comet takes place around 100 A.D., ish as far as i can tell this comet is responsible for a lot of the the last bit of destruction and it basically it clears out a lot of other cultures that used to exist for the cultures we now know today to come in and take over for example the british isles before this comet takes place nobody would go over there the british isles existed to some extent or another but nobody would go and take it. Now, this is backed up by archaeology. Interestingly enough, and I'm going to say this just because it's interesting, if we look back in the history up there, in the northern history, and the reason why people steered clear of the British Isles is because the group of people that currently inhabited that island before this comet hit were said to be a race of extraordinarily vicious giants. Now, nah, that's not really part of the chronology, but it's fascinating to think about that, man, that that is what they report. This comet takes out that entire area. This is why we find in the stories, for example, uh, we find in, in like the King Arthur story, for example, that there are the wastelands, right? Everybody has this wasteland story suddenly around this period of time up there in the northern area. And right now we might actually be able to blame it on this comet. It gets even more interesting, but all right. anyway, that, that, that's the last point in the chronology. I just want to get through that. So a quick recap. We've talked long enough. We start with the Golden Age, of which I don't have dates for. Yeah, I know. Great chronology. But then that's punctuated, and our chronology begins with the event that we know as the Deluge. The Deluge happens around between 5,000 and 12,000 B.C., then after that goes on the the planets you know they're trying to find their new orbits and and humanity's going through hell through all this by the way there's, there's a lot of stuff happening here obviously but then you know eventually things start to settle down enough to where civilizations can build up and then suddenly venus shows up between 1400 bce and 1700 bce and destroys everybody kicks everybody in the balls and then runs away actually does she does it a few times and then she goes away so venus comes by slaps us around moves on the next event that we have to deal with the major event that we deal with is the mars event the mars events take place between 550 bc and 800 bce and there's a couple of different you know situations in there with mars but mars is the culprit the main culprit in that contact those are the three main points and then we follow it up with the last smaller catastrophe, but a catastrophe that really does set the stage for everything that we now know here. And that's whatever, some weird, some comet of some size or another either did a really close by, pass by of Earth, yeah, close by, pass by, either really closely passed by Earth, or you even have some people that say it impacted Earth, but I have not seen evidence of the impact impacts are a little weird because of how things work I'm not saying it didn't happen if, if somebody can find proof of the impact of that particular comment i would love to see it that'd be great but you don't need impacts to create that level of destruction all you need is electrically charged planetary sized bodies or even smaller ones but you know a good size and, and that can do some serious damage and by all accounts according to all of our ancestors that is exactly what happened that's the chronology right now as we understand it that we will use as a guide for all of the other stuff that we have talked about on this channel and will continue to talk about on this channel 
Now as a quick side note, I fully hope and expect to one day make another one of these videos that has updated scientific information which either solidifies and proves even further everything that we have talked about here or that changes the stuff that we have talked about here and gives us a better and clearer picture of our past based on scientific evidence. That is the only true way to look at history. You have got to be ready to change your outlook if you are ever going to come close to the truth. All right. Now, that's it. Okay. So that it's longer than I was expecting, but that's our chronology. So that's just something that we have to deal with. And if you lasted this long, seek help. Yes, you are mentally unstable and you need to get some help. You should, I don't know, probably get your life together. Like, probably take my own advice. Yeah, 